Uh, the faculty lecture series. For those of you who don't know who I am, I'm Jess Gillardi. I am professor and director. And part of my fun service that I get to do for the university is coordinate the faculty lecture series. So thanks for attending tonight. Uh, keep an eye out for upcoming lectures. The next one will be uh, next week, uh, same time, same place. That will have uh, Dr. Carly Eisman from Counselor Education giving her lecture. <coughs> Tonight's event is uh, presented by Professor Mary Wilhelm, Assistant Professor of Drawing and Painting. Professor Wilhelm received her Bachelor of Fine Arts with a focus in painting and drawing from Florida State University. Then she received her Master's of Fine Arts in painting from Arizona State University, the other ASU. <laughs> <coughs> Mary is currently an Assistant Drawing and Painting Professor here, um, who is also part of nationally exhibit artists, exhibited artists having um, shown her work in Los Angeles, New Orleans, uh, Miami, and Phoenix. Mary earned the 2022 solo exhibition at the, ex, uh, at the Arizona Sonora Desert Museum, 2000, and in 2014 was awarded a research grant to travel to Vienna, Austria, and, uh, to study the transition from the surrealism to visionary art. So in this captivating lecture we're about to um, experience, we'll dive into the intriguing world of coyotes, exploring not only their biological significance, but also their profound influence on our culture and their relationship to humans as a whole. We will journey through the coyotes' complex role in the ecosystem. We'll uncover the inspiration behind artists and storyteller, storyteller Mary Wilhelm's narrative oil paintings, and how these creatures serve as nuanced and complex characters within her work. Coyotes, often misunderstood and underappreciated animals, play a pivotal role in maintaining ecological balance and filling an ecological niche often left open by the expatriation of larger apex predators. Yeah. Yeah. As we unravel their ecological importance, we'll connect the dots between their resilience in the wild and the profound lessons they impart in our own narratives. So help me in welcoming Professor Wilhelm. Thank you, I appreciate that a lot. So, I saw you raise your hand. I was like, do we have a question already? Um, no, and like, like uh, Jess was saying, my name is Mary Wilhelm. And yes, I, you know, he covered all of my like beginning intro for me. I wasn't expecting that. Um, but yes, I'm the assistant drawing and painting professor here at Adams State University. I'm brand new. I moved here in August. Um, and I just want to thank everybody first and foremost, one for the opportunity to speak tonight. This is great. I've been like so jazzed to do this lecture. And then on top of that, just, you know, taking time out of your Thursday to come here and, you know, see me talk about something that I'm super interested in. I love coyotes. I think they're great. Um, and I'm really excited to talk about them today. Um, this kind of, this, uh, you know, this talk starts with like sort of a brief introduction to myself as an artist. Some of you who have seen my artist talk, might have seen a little bit of this before, so I'm going to apologize if there's any repetition. Um, but I'm going to then get into like the coyote as an animal, both you know biologically and symbolically, and then start talking about how it factors into my own work and my own narrative. I just want to preface this too by saying I am not a biologist. I am an artist. So I won't necessarily be getting into like the nitty gritty of these animals and like really getting into like genomes and like the super complex, like really nuanced stuff that a biologist might get into. Um, I'm going to really be just approaching it um, from a more general standpoint. This talk is designed so that people in a, you know, a general, you know, population can kind of like learn and appreciate these animals. Um, you know, and something that I really, you know, want to acknowledge is that these animals also have sort of a tenuous relationship with people, um, particularly in present day. And I'm not saying that anybody in here maybe has that viewpoint now, but if you do, I just encourage you to be a little bit uh, like, just be open minded about it, be interested in the animals. Um, and be interested in the new information. You know, you don't have to walk away again from this talk with like, yes, I love coyotes. That's me. That's why I'm here. But you know, if you come away with at least a little bit new, little bit more new information, you can like see one on the side of the road and be like, oh, that animal does X, Y, Z things. That's pretty cool. Just like, you know, just, just a little bit of, of that is kind of what I'm going for. 
So I'm gonna start very briefly who I am. Again, just kind of covered most of this, but I am from Florida originally, and whenever I tell anybody this, I whenever I'm outside the state of Florida, I kind of like get this little bit of a head tilt, and then just the words, I'm sorry, followed by, you know, kind of like some, some like, is Florida man real? Yes, he's real. And he's like, and he is around every Publix in, in the state of Florida. You have to be very wary. Um, but yeah, I got my MFA or my BFA from Florida State University in 2015. My Arizona, my, my Arizona, my MFA from Arizona State in uh, 2021. And I've always been kind of an out, like a pretty outdoorsy person, you know, growing up. I love to do rock hounding. When I was living in Florida, I you would bike like hundreds of miles and Florida's all flat, so that's like pretty easy. But on top of that, my mom also would like take my sister and I to these sort of outdoor, you know, nature preserve things and like I would just have fun running through, you know, the Florida like, you know, a uh, uh, brush and, you know, exploring. And something that was really interesting to me as like just a person and a human were animals. Like I love nature, but animals are like the thing that I'm really connected to just as a person and as an artist. And a lot of that was kind of from being outside, you know, growing up, I was a little bit of a feral <laughs> child. My mother's not here, but she is visiting and I tried to get her to come to this and she can confirm that. So despite being Florida being a kind of really weird place, it is, you know, one of the benefits to living there is I'm 45 minutes north, or at least, you know, being from Tampa, I was 45 minutes north of St. Petersburg, which houses the second largest collection of Salvador Dali work in the world. And it was a, probably one of the first artists that I actually knew about growing up. He was like an intrinsic sort of part of who I, who I was as just like a person. And like from the age of like five, there was these little cartoons they would show us in my art class. There were these little Salvador flying mustaches that would like explain to us the history of Salvador Dali. And it's something that's like also like just deeply influenced me as an artist and as a painter. Um, on top of that, I grew up in the 90s, early 2000s. Something that really influenced me was just storytelling. You know, books, movies, TV, all kinds of stories that like I, you know, I before I even consider myself an oil painter and artist, a lot of times I just consider myself a storyteller. I work very narratively. A lot of times the animals in my work end up becoming, you know, characters in their own right. And something that really drew me, like from a really early age, I wasn't necessarily super interested in like really black and white stories between good and evil. You know, my maybe like really early on, because you know, I, my brain hadn't fully developed, but you know kind of as I was really, really getting into like narratives and stories, what I really, really enjoyed were the, you know, the stories that were like really newer, nuanced, that had characters that were morally complex and sort of gray. Um, I found those to be super, super intriguing and really interesting. And it's something that I'm always kind of trying to aim for in my work when I'm using animals as sort of these characters. But before I was even really even getting into that, a lot of my work was, you know, it was more intuitive. I was working, you know, uh, primarily like I would have images, I would kind of like paint them. And I was using animals that are called like charismatic megafauna. And those are like your lions and your tigers and your bears. Oh my. Um, they are your really, they are considered um, your animals with really large symbolic or popular appeal. And you know, I, again, when I was working super intuitively and I wasn't really necessarily like really th like, you're not necessarily not thinking, but like I was working in a way that was more subconscious. I was more drawn to these particular animals and like, you know, portraying, portraying them. Um, and the narratives that were involved in my art were more of a subconscious proje projection of experiences or stories that I had surrounding me at the time. So these, those paintings were actually in like 20, 2015, so about the end of my you know, undergraduate, undergraduate cr career. These are like 11 foot tall paintings, FYI, and just if anybody out there, you know, I see some of my students out there, your artists, keep in mind, if you paint that large, you have to either A, sell them, or they get turned into canvas burritos and sit in your studio for like a decade. That's where they are right now. <laughs> um, so about 2018, I had moved to Arizona, 
it was, you know, I was starting my grad program and one of the things that like really influenced me as I was kind of really starting to think about my work, I was really trying to aim for something a little bit more nuanced. I was getting sort of tired of painting these really large sort of, again, charismatic animals. I wanted something that was, I felt would tell a better story or a more nuanced story. I picked up this book and this was not anything super conscious. I was like, oh, coyotes, I've you know, never really read about them. I sort of see them wandering around my neighborhood in Arizona. This would be kind of interesting to read about. And this book made me absolutely fall in love with these animals. And it's just something that if you are ever like really interested in learning about coyotes and not really necessarily getting into like this super nitty gritty of like, again, them as like an entire species, this is where I would start. And you know, as time passed and I was like really beginning to, again, work more nuanced, I was trying to think of animals that I could work with that had kind of like a little bit more of a tenuous relationship with people. They weren't always necessarily viewed very positively. And I ended up finding this one. And I just, again, I think it was partially that I was in Arizona at the time. So my, you know, my interactions with a lot of animals were primarily coyotes. You might see a gray fox sort of eating the leftover cat food that's for some reason my neighbor was leaving out. Um, but, you know, for the most part, it's just I was really drawn to them um, because of this book. So now I'm going to start kind of getting into you know, behavior, a little bit of history about them. This is where I start, sort of start riffing at this point in the presentation. So we're going to see how that goes. Um, but pre-Columbus, coyotes are actually confined to the open plains of Western and, and open plains in Western regions of North America. And like that's still a really huge range, but they were primarily in, located in, in that part of North America. The term coyote was actually first used by Francisco Javier Carviero's Historia de Mexico and comes from the Nahuatl name Coyote. And these animals were, um, their relationship pre-Columbus with the indigenous people that were here was very different from kind of present day. Um, and you, it's kind of hard to talk about the coyote as an animal without talking a little bit of its significance to indigenous people in terms of an entity. And I want to sort of stop here and pause. I'm going to be using this term trickster sort of for this portion. And I want to acknowledge that when we're talking about these particular entities, um, they are inherently defined as being unknowable. Um, and when you start assigning language and you start assigning terms to something, you know, to name something is to know something. And the idea of these entities or these beings is that you really couldn't know them. They were supposed to fall outside of social convention. And so I'm using the term trickster because it's the closest we're going to get, but it's still like a pretty Western term and does not necessarily encompass the entire being. And they were, you know, in like Old Man Coyote, there's like different variations of them. You have Old Man Coyote, you have um, Crow, and then there's a couple others. But they were, again, these entities that are called trickster entities, again, Western. Um, but they were sort of considered both good and evil. Um, they were sometimes malevolent, but they were also like, you know, they would do things that were sometimes really helpful, but they were mainly pushing against social convention and they would bring about change. Um, there's, they're often compared to sort of like Loki or Kitsunes or the Monkey King, you know, in uh, Chinese history. Um, and they're involved in a lot of, they're involved in the creation, some creation stories, um, the introduction of fire to mankind and kind of a Promethean um, similarity. Um, and the stories of evil and lechery at the same time. So they kind of embodied a little bit of both. But their, you know, their main thing was they were bringers of change, essentially. One of the books that I've, you know, I kind of like to read some of the stories just because they're kind of interesting. One of the books that I have that's a really nice sort of balance of both the good and the bad um, is this book by Barry Lopez. Again, if you can find it, it's really interesting. Just kind of a little compilation of some of the stories. Um, but it was what really fascinated for me like about that was, uh, you know, they were a gray area. They had nuance to them. They weren't necessarily good or evil. Um, and that was kind of something I was sort of like looking to explore in my work at that time or during that time. Still to this time, I still paint a lot of coyotes. Um, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about their behavior. 
and kind of them as like animals. You'll see, I, I don't necessarily talk about each of these paintings, but I do have some of my work in here. Um, if you have any questions afterwards and want to like ask me about a specific piece, I'd be more than willing to talk about it. But coyotes as a species, their behavior really interested me. So I had like an, in, like I, I learned a little bit about like sort of the indigenous sort of um, sim symbology behind them. But I was, what I was really interested, what I was really drawn to was their behavior as animals in the natural world. And part of that was, and part of that sort of started with this idea of like this, their fusion, a vision fusion species. And what I mean by that is that they are animals that can kind of come together and then split apart into subgroups depending on their, uh, you know, like environmental factors. So, you know, if you have like a lot of rural sort of open land, coyotes will like often form bigger packs as opposed to like if they're in more urban sort of suburban environments, they'll kind of spread out and sort of separate into like smaller family units. And there's a lot of actual animals that do this behavior. There's elephants, dolphins. And on top of that, one of the animals that does this are people. And I thought that was really interesting just because, again, you know, it's, you know, you see it sort of in our daily lives. Like you'll have your friend groups, you have your coworkers, you have, you know, your family unit that you probably go back home to. And you're able to kind of, one, come together into groups and then sort of separate out depending on like, you know, your environmental needs, your work needs. Um, and that was just sort of an interesting parallel that I sort of started to note with coyotes and people. Um, and then on top of that, you know, coyotes fall in this sort of really interesting ecological niche where they are both predator and prey. And by that, I mean, you know, they'll hunt like the smaller little animals, but at the same time, they're prey for a lot of like, you know, our apex predators. So again, like our mountain lions, our bears, our, you know, I was about to say tigers, but they're not in North America. Um, <laughs> all over in the, pl all over my brain. But you know, like your gray wolves, and I, always, I thought that was really interesting, and it got me sort of thinking about people. Because, you know, I don't know about you guys, I'm blind as a bat. If you put me in a fisticuff fight with a lion, I am ultimately gonna lose. Um, and I think as people, we like to think of ourselves as, ourselves as like apex predators. But, you know, from what I, you know, when, when I was reading this book and I was also like just thinking about coyote behavior, and, you know, we are such intelligent animals and coyotes are really smart. And part of the reason that they got so smart is because they have to function in this sort of gray area. They have to be able to hunt their prey, but also un, like outthink the predators around them. So they have kind of a, pro like, you know, in so their own way, kind of a problem solving sort of capability, again, not to maybe the extent that people do, but they have that sort of like in, like higher level intelligence because they need to be able to outthink something that's going to hunt them. And people, you know, as we are evolved, we were evolving, we weren't necessarily the apex predators. We, you know, if you, again, if you go out into the nature and you are face to face with a mountain lion, you're probably going to lose. I know I would. Um, I just, I can't punch a lion that hard. Um, but, you know, so we occupy sort of a similar gray area where we're both predator and prey. And one of the benefits as people, why we have been able to be so prolific is because we're able, you know, we figured out a way to like use our smarts to get together and build, you know, things that could essentially take out those really big apex predators. But again, our inherent being, who we are, you know, again, if you're like put face to face with like a big animal like that, you're probably not going to win. Um, so I just thought that was like a really interesting sort of parallel there. Um, and one of the other sort of interesting things about coyotes is as they are actually, you know, if you, if you go out and you actually like kill coyotes, they have this really inherent, they have this sort of like biological reaction that as their populations are put under stress, they will actually produce larger litters. And they will, you know, their populations won't go down. They might go down for a short amount of time, but they'll go back up again and might increase and then stabilize after a point. And that is also a benefit of, again, being in that sort of in-between of being predator and prey. Because if you're being preyed on by an apex predator, you need to find a way, you need to have some biological reaction that is going to continue to, like, allow your population to Pro, you know, continue past, you know, the hunting of the apex predator. And, and that was just really interesting because when you really start looking at coyotes, particularly after colonization and like a Western perspective, they're really considered 
pests. And, you know, often people, you know, there are coyote hunting uh, tournaments where they will go out and sort of kill these animals. And there's a certain level of situational irony in that. And the fact that the more you kill them, that like, they're just going to have larger litters. They're just going to, <laughs> they're just going to produce more of them. Um, and they're going to, the populations are going to stay pretty stable. Um, and then again, another really sort of interesting biological just features are actually strictly, they're one of the few animals that are strictly monogamous. Um, in comparison to like, you know, even their closest rel relatives in North America, like foxes and wolves, there will normally and be an, a wolf pack, be one breeding male and potent maybe one female, but sometimes there's about two. And coyotes are strictly monogamous. I mean, they will mate with one partner and then it stays that partner until, you know, maybe one of them passes. Um, and it's really, it's, it's kind of funny because I had a couple friends when I was living in Tucson, they left their dogs out and they weren't fixed and they were female and they got pregnant by a coyote. And if that happens, that coyote is going to stay around forever. It will not leave that dog. You will basically have a little coyote buddy until, you know, either it dies or, you know, something happens to the, to its partner. So post Columbus, um, you know, after we had, you know, when Westerners and colonizers came in, you know, they did the, the manifest destiny. They started moving west. And the interesting thing about that, not necessarily good thing about that, is that as colonizers were moving west, you know, they were starting to kill our apex predators. So like our, our gray wolves, our mountain lions, and our, you know, our grizzly bears. Part of the reason for that was because they were trying, they viewed these apex predators as competition for the big sexy game animals. So your elk and your deer. And colonizers didn't want that competition. So they eradicated or expatriated a lot of these animals as they were moving west. And at the, you know, at the same time, they're starting to develop railroads, they're building cities. And there's like this sort of ironic movement as, you know, as colonizers are moving west, we have coyotes start moving east because one, colonizers are, and westerners are taking out a lot of these apex predators that kept the populations, you know, down and stable. And they're also, coyotes are highly, highly adaptable animals. Again, because they function in that predator prey sort of gray area, they have a high level of intelligence that makes them an incredibly flexible species. So they were able to learn how to function in these new sort of suburban and urban environments. They were able to learn how to not only function, but thrive in them. They didn't have the pressures of apex predators anymore. They could just spread out. Um, so there, and at that same point in time, colonizers and we're starting to really have a bad relationship with the, these animals. They're like, we've taken out the wolves, we've taken out the bears, we've taken out the mountain lions. Why are these, you know, they were called, you know, some of them called them prairie wolves. Why are they not dying? You know, we're poisoning them, we're shooting them, we're having hunting tournaments. They still keep coming back. And it's, you know, it's partially because they didn't realize that as they're putting pressure on the population that they're, again, producing larger litters. Um, but it was like, it was sort of, again, a situational irony. Like they were having this, you know, quote unquote problem with these animals, um, but it was kind of at the fault of their own actions. And that again, just brings me back to this point where coyotes are incredibly adaptable animals. They are able to function not only in rural and urban and suburban environments, but they're able to thrive in them. And you know, that is actually super beneficial for a lot of species that live in these environments because coyotes act as kind of environmental protectors in these urban and suburban environments. They are, you know, able to, you know, there's, a, there's this trend where they are actually able to prote protect um, native bird populations. And part of the reason for that is I love cats. I'm not saying this because I hate cats. I have two cats. Feral cats in North America are an incredibly damaging thing to, uh, incredibly damaging animal to have to the native bird populations. They are very efficient hunters. They are very good at capturing birds, you know, and, you know, eating them essentially. 
And coyotes act as kind of a protector because their, their likelihood of going after native birds is a lot lower. They are more likely to go after the cat, the feral cat that's outside, and they will eat that. And so in suburban, and again, suburban and um, urban environments where we don't have our apex predators to take out you know, these feral animals, we have coyotes move in and essentially act as sort of biodiversity preservers. Um, and again, they replace or fill ni niches originally inhabited by apex predators that have all but been eradicated. And again, they exist now in almost every corner of the United States at this point. Like, they are in New York City. There's actually this image of a coyote that was this female that became famous around New York City that would, like, get on the tops of these buildings and just, like, hang out. And she became, like, this really sort of, like, almost symbol for, like, life in New York. Um, and I found this, my, I had this really funny meme that someone sent to me literally last night when I was talking to them about the native, uh, the coyotes preserving the native bird populations. Um, just felt like that was appropriate right there. Um, but so, you know, again, like part of this talk is like sort of trying to convince everyone why coyotes are important. So it's like symbolically, if we're going back to, again, them as like a metaphor, they're dualistic. So, and I kind of interpret that as, you know, that, that in between of being both predator and prey, the ability to sort of shift between environments, you know, they are both wise and they are also foolish. They're both good and bad. And because of this duality, symbolically, I consider them kind of whole. You know, they embody both the dark and the light. Um, and then on top of that, biologically, they serve, like, like I've been talking this entire time, they survive. They are so adaptable. Um, they are able to fill in for keystone predators when those species have been nearly hunted to extinction. And then why are coyotes specifically important to people? This is a quote that I actually took from Dan Flores' book. When you talk about coyotes or about tricksters in general, we are talking about avatars that most closely resemble ourselves as human. And part of that is because I think as people, we always want to think like, oh, I'm really good. I'm, you know, I, you know, ideally we like to try, but most often than not, even if we have the best intentions, sometimes our actions are, aren't always the best. Sometimes where we're coming from isn't always the best. We are essentially shades of gray. You know, some might be lighter shades, some might be darker shades, um, but we have that sort of duality within us. And so coyotes kind of show us ourselves. They show us, you know, the good and the bad. They show us, like, the fact, because we are very similar to them, we are these species that function in between that area of predator and prey. Um, we, you know, they show us that we have wit, we have ingenuity, we're able to adapt and expand. Um, but they also show us kind of our own failures and our darkness, uh, you know, sometimes our almost comical failures at the same time. Like, we try to eradicate these animals and they just spread further. Um, it's, so there's something that's sort of interesting about that dynamic. And they also encourage us to change and to grow. Like, if a coyote can do it, if a coyote can figure out how to function at the top of some skyscraper, well, maybe not skyscraper, but tall building in New York, I think we can too. So yeah, this is just my fun little chart. I have a lot of fun in PowerPoint. I like making little charts and doing things. Um, but there's really a, a large overlap. Again, behaviorally, um, you know, evolutionarily um, between people and coyotes. And I think it's, it's hard sometimes to sort of see that reflection because again, they have such a negative connotation um, in you know, present day contemporary society. We don't, you know, it, they're sort of, um, where their sort of cousins, the wolves, you know, started off kind of negative from the 18, 1900s. Wolves have had a slight uptick in sort of their visual, like their public appeal. But coyotes have, you know, since pretty much, you know, at least for colonizers, since we've been in North America, they've always kind of been viewed as sort of like not super great. But I think that's partially, again, because they are, end up being sort of a reflection of us. Like, they're spreading, they're moving east, they're kind of causing all these, again, quote-unquote problems, um, but they're really doing something similar to, like, again, kind of what colonizers did a little bit, and just what people do, you know, just spreading out and kind of adapting to the environments that they, you know, are in. So, in terms of coyotes in my work, this, you know, after reading this book, and again, like being sort of interested in them as to like an animal in particular, 
um, I found they really served as this just really interesting sort of folk, like uh, captivating symbolic focal point for me in my work. And I really liked the fact that, again, they weren't necessarily apex predators. They weren't necessarily prey. They were kind of that in-between. They had an adaptability and a flexibility to them. And again, like a nuance as an animal that I really enjoyed. And not just in, like a nuance in you know, their sort of biological and ecological importance, but also in their relationship with people. It's been a really long, complicated history, you know, going all the way back to like pre-Columbus indigenous, you know, their interpretation of these animals was that, you know, both good and evil, dark and light. And that kind of, you know, even though it tracks more to the negative today, there's still that kind of um, symbology there within them. And I really like, you know, in my work, I use animals kind of as a way to sort of talk about people a lot and i felt that at least using coyotes from the standpoint that i was looking at they were a really good sort of nuanced lens that i could kind of explore the complexities of the human existence and that was just really attractive to me i love i love me some gray characters in literature and other media and then on top of that I really talked a little bit too fast, but that's okay. Um, but on top of that, like on a personal level too, coyotes for me ended up, you know, as I was sort of developing this relationship with them as an artist, um, they really start to sort of represent hope for me in a lot of different ways. Um, you know, I work a lot with animals in my work and being, you know, invest interested in those kind of you know, themes, you do end up sort of learning about a lot of sort of the negative uh, impacts modern society has had on our animal populations. I can't remember the exact number, but it's like six or seven species go extinct a day. It's something like kind of insane a little bit. We're living through like the six six mass six like six mass extinction and this is like the first one that's like really been done that's by people essentially and it's kind of uh unprecedented because of that um and i have to acknowledge on some part as a person as a person and an artist that there's a highly likely chance that a lot of our you know charismatic megafauna a lot of our bears a lot of our lions there's a highly likely chance they won't make it you know, and that's really depressing to me. You know, we are developing and we are poaching animals again at an unprecedented rate. rate. Um, and it's heartbreaking in a lot of ways. I try not to think about it too much or else I'll start crying. I, we don't need to have that right now. Um, but I try to remind myself a lot. I was like, well, we might lose those animals, but I know on some level, in some form, coyotes, because they are so adaptable, because they are so good at surviving, they will probably at least make it. Like, even if, you know, the, we completely eradicate, you know, the rest of nature, coyotes, because they can figure out how to survive in suburban and urban environments, they will be able to continue on. And nature has this really fun way when things start to bottleneck like that, and species, you know, you know there might be like one or two species you know, over a couple hundred million years, those species eventually start to diversify again. So they will start to spread out. And we might have a, entirely new ecosystems that are built around, you know, these, you know, predecessors of coyotes that were left over. So again, it's kind of like, it's kind of my way of like not being super depressed about the state of the world. It kind of gives me that, they're like that little like bright light at the end of the tunnel. And to a certain extent, I feel that way about like pigeons and rats and even cockroaches to a certain extent. Like again, our really big sexy animals, they might not make it, but are like little kind of annoying things that kind of like interrupt our daily lives. They probably will. And from that nature will kind of, you know, do that thing again. It will diversify. It'll expand out. And that, give, again, just gives me some hope. Um, but they also kind of, for me as a person, you know, they kind of taught me how to cope with things through humor in a lot of ways. My Instagram algorithm has learned that I like watching funny coyote videos. <laughs> So it often like shows me like coyotes playing with the dog toys in the yard, like, you know, some th things that always kind of make me laugh. And, you know, as an artist, again, because I'm always trying to sort of like 
you know, not get super, like throw myself over into the heavy, heavy side too much. I really try to, you know, try to keep that humor in my work. And it's, again, it's partially a coping mechanism because it just feels like sometimes the world's on fire a little bit. Um, and coyotes kind of remind me like, it's okay. You can, you know, paint a coyote eating pineapple pizza and pooping. And that's your way of dealing with, you know, the modern society that we kind of live in. And on top of the fact of, you know, just being like adaptable animals and like being a millennial where I've had to sit there and sometimes get three or four different jobs in order to just pay rent, you know, and do like, I feel like I've had to diversify as a person and as a species, I have to be adaptable. I have to learn how to, you know, function in the society because my, my rent's like three, you know, was at that point, like three fourths of my income. It was something that like, I, again, I was just looked at coyotes. I was like, well, if they can do it, so can I, you know, I can kind of figure this out. Um, so, you know, and I, they just taught me a more nuanced approach to animals. They taught me a more nuanced approach to storytelling um, and how to find humor in different situations and how to look at things in a different light too. Because again, I didn't necessarily have an entirely like positive view of coyotes when I first started learning about them. Like, I was kind of neutral about them. I was, you know, I never considered myself even necessarily like a dog person. I was like, I'm all for cats. Um, but they really like, you know, I just had like my perspective on them again, just shifted and it's continued to shift over the few years that I've, you know, worked with them and been painting them. And, you know, again, I don't expect people to come away with this talk exactly loving coyotes like I do. It's not necessarily my goal, and I said, stayed this at the beginning. Um, you know, again, I just kind of hope people come away with it being like, oh, that's actually a really cool fact. Now I know that when they see that, they can apply that to the animal they see in real life. Um, and I know, in a bigger scheme, I know as an artist, um, there's a highly unlikely chance that I'm gonna like make an art piece that's going to like drastically impact the world in one day and everybody's mind's just gonna change and everybody's just gonna be like, yes, we need to protect our environment. We need to protect our biodiversity. We should just live underground as mole people from now on. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I know that's probably highly unlikely um, but I think that in my own small way, like even just by giving this talk or, you know, using them in my work, like, again, I, I don't have to change people's like minds completely on coyotes. I just have to like shift their perspective a little bit, get like a little bit of like, oh, that's kind of an interesting information. And maybe by doing that, it'll open them to have their perspective changed on something else. And with that, we can all become like with that and that sort of mindset and that, you know, maybe just a little bit of a perspective shift, you know, we can become more compassionate and empathetic people, not only to the animals we share this world with, but to each other as well. So I have a story that I have kind of in my artist statement on my website. We're at 640. I don't necessarily know if I want to read the entire thing right now, um, but I have it sort of at the end. Um, I, it is on my website if you are interested in reading it, but it is kind of like the sort of the, I have my professional artist statement. That's like the thing I send to galleries, but then I have this narrative that I've built that is really the framework that I want the audience when they're approaching my work to sort of view the animals from. Um, and if you get the chance, you should definitely, you know, definitely read it. Again, I'm not going to do that right now because I'm starting to actually hit my limit with talking. I'm like, okay, Mary, breathe. Um, but again, it's just, you know, if, if you're on campus, I do have a lot of my work up in the Hatfield Gallery at Adam, you know, over in the art building that's over that way. Um, and I encourage you to one, read the story and then, you know, go look at the work because again, it, it's, there are a lot of coyotes in that gallery. There's a lot of us, other animals as well. And it just, it, it adds a little bit of a different, you know, another layer to sort of what I'm working with. Um, yeah. So I want to thank you guys for coming out tonight. I talked a little bit faster than I intended to, but if you have any questions or thoughts about life or the mysteries of the universe, I would love to hear them. Um, these are my socials. Um, just thank you. Thank you again for coming out. It means a lot to me. I appreciate it. <laughs>
Yes, Bill, what's up? I have a question. Yes. Well, actually, um, it's really, my first thought was, wow, you really have a way of humanizing coyotes, but I don't feel that anymore. I feel mm -hmm. like you, you coyoteized me mm -hmm. a little bit to this kind of stuff. So I, we've already had a little bit of this conversation. Mm -hmm. And I, the stand-ins of the animals for the humans, mm -hmm. but can you just say something a little bit about buttons? Because you had a few of those with buttons, and the last one with the size. That's the buttons. that's kind of a different okay? little. No, it's a, it's okay. It's a, it's a different sort of tangent, a little bit. Okay, no. Um, no, no, it's okay. I can answer. It's, it's fine. I can actually see if I can pull up one of my images with actually the buttons <clears throat> in them, so I can talk about it. Um, no, I worked with a group of like a lot of artists who were really big into like gaining enlightenment in different ways, and they would always go like veer towards these like really deep. You know, they, they, their approach to it was just really different from like mine. Like they were always like going off and like studying these really deep philosophies and, you know, and, you know, doing some other things. And that not in itself is not necessarily like I appreciate that. I support, you know, whatever anybody has to do that they feel is the best way they're trying to explore their consciousness. Um, but I always felt like you can attain like sort of an expanded consciousness or an enlightenment from just everyday things. Um, and I was looking, when I was doing like this particular painting, I was trying to think of like, okay, well, what's something that I would contemplate that's kind of like silly and sort of goofy and like colorful and something I can include in my paintings that like, you know, is sort of this stand in for, you know, this, this catalyst to, to, for expanded consciousness, essentially. And this is, again, this is a little bit more into specific paintings and, you know, specific bodies of work and what I'm working with there. But I just settled on buttons because they were fun. Like, honestly, I, I would just like sit there around. My mom used to have these tins of buttons and I would just like play with them. And I just like had so much delight in that. And I was just like, I feel like I could attain enlightenment just by like playing with buttons as a child. So it was kind of like me going back to that more than anything. Um, and so it's, it, yeah, it was, it was just silly. It was either that or it was going to be Skittles. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Skittles. I love Skittles a lot. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. Well, if you do, I, I guess I'll be here for a second. <laughs> uh, Jess, I don't know. Is that we're just good? Okay. Thanks. Oop. Oop. Was that informative, Bill? I honestly didn't even notice it. I was like, I like feel like I blacked out a little bit when I'm sitting there like talking, I'm like, you know.